My guest today is so cool. I really love the way he thinks, the types of questions he's asking, the way he's looking at cardiovascular health. Uh, my guest is Dr. Stephen Hussey. He's a chiropractor and functional medicine practitioner. Um, he has a doctorate of chiropractic and master's in human nutrition and functional medicine from the University of Western States in Portland, Oregon. He's a health coach, speaker, and he's the author of two books on health. Uh, the first being The Health Evolution, Why Understanding Evolution is the Key to Vibrant Health. And um, and the second one is Understanding the Heart. Uh, this, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Understanding the Heart, Surprising Insights into the Evolutionary Origins of Heart Disease and Why It Matters. Uh, if you happen to follow Dr. Hussey on Instagram, you're probably already like, ooh, yay, I can't wait to listen to this. Like he just has such compelling personal story, uh, which I'm not going to spoil. So just check it out. And also questions he's asking with data to back up his points of view that are just so compelling in terms of how we're looking at heart health. So good. So yeah, I'm just not going to take up any more time. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hussey. So here we go. This is Dr. Stephen Hussey. Okay. So Dr. Hussey, I have been so excited for this interview and I, I can't believe it took me this long to get you on. One of my clients was like, Hey, you should have Stephen Hussey on you. I'm like, oh, why have I not had Stephen Hussey on my podcast? <laughs> so thank you for coming on. And uh, we're going to talk all about the heart today. And that's the name of your book is understanding the heart. Um, and really, I think such a powerful part of who you are and what you bring to the health table is your own personal story with this. So would you mind sharing that story with the audience? Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just like most people in this space, it started with, you know, health issues that I, you know, worked to overcome. Um, and those started at a very young age. You know, I had a lot of inflammatory conditions uh, from the age of two. Uh, I had asthma. Um, I had really bad allergies. I used to break out in like giant hives all over my body. Uh, and the doctors didn't know why. Um, I had irritable bowel syndrome, uh, ended up at age nine being diagnosed with type one diabetes, um, quote unquote autoimmune in nature. That's the mm -hmm. theory. Um, and so, um, yeah, my parents and I were just kind of relying on Western medicine, uh, to manage these things. And that's the key word manage, uh, yeah. no explanation of why they were happening, just kind of suppress the symptoms with different drugs and things. Uh, and it wasn't until, uh, college, when I started getting interested in health, that I found that the way I live my life directly impacted my ability to manage these conditions and ultimately, in the long run, get rid of most of them, um, aside from the type 1 diabetes uh, that I um, had. That's kind of like collateral damage, you know, the damage had been done. Um, but yeah, no longer hives, no longer IBS, none of that stuff. Um, and, you know, went on, you know, living my life and being curious about health, um, you know, digging deeper, but always having heart disease in the back of my head because I've been trained by physicians as a kid and young adult um, that having type one diabetes heavily predisposes you to heart disease. Mm. Uh, and this is like disease of the small blood vessels um, in the body. So in the eyes and in the kidney and in the extremities, that's why we have neuropathy and things like that. So um, anything about heart disease always piqued my interest. And I found that, um, you know, I learned the conventional way of thinking about the heart and heart disease um, and then more unconventional ways, I always just read things with no filter, um, no real preconceived notions. And um, then to my shock and surprise, uh, at the age of 34, I had a massive heart attack. Um, and, you know, just to, you know, give some people some background, um, you know, leading up to that and why I think it happened. Um, it, I was under a lot of stress at the time. Uh, it was during COVID. There's a lot of things happening and that I didn't really... Uh, stand for, and it was frustrating to me. Um, and then I actually got some of the worst news in my life or most stressful news in my life a day and a half before I had the heart attack. Wow. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the news itself, even though that was stressful, it was the inability of me or my family to do anything about that news uh, mm -hmm. for this person. We were just sitting and waiting, hoping that they mm -hmm. would be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was stressful. And then, um, you know, I think there was an aspect of dehydration at the time, uh, considering what I was doing, the way I was eating and not repleting or replenishing electrolytes and, and water. Um, I think there was an aspect of oxalate dumping that was happening because of the way I was eating. Um, and then ultimately, I think the straw that brought the camel's back was I unwisely did a very intense workout um, the morning I had the heart attack. Uh, I woke up in this state of stress and dehydration and all this stuff. 
Um, and I did my usual like sprint up a hill, drop and do pushups till you fail, do lunges till you fail, um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then right. maybe about 30 minutes later, it happened. Um, wow. And so all that kind of stuff led up to it. But, you know, being type one, I'm predisposed. And, you know, but interestingly, six months before uh, the heart attack, I had a CAC score done, which is a measure of uh, calcification of, of um, plaque in heart arteries. And mine was zero. There was no calcification, which is a very good, healthy score that doesn't measure soft plaque um, in the arteries. However, uh, when they did the heart cath and angiogram to place the stent, when I was having a heart attack, they found no atherosclerosis anywhere. Um, all they found was a giant clot that had formed in my left anterior descending artery. Um, so it was a spontaneous acute clot, um, which is, I would argue, how most heart attacks happen, um, despite what we're told. And so, um, so yeah, you know, that plunged me even deeper into heart disease um, and and figuring out uh, why this had happened. And I had, you know, written about three quarters of the book um, before it happened. And then oh, wow. fortunately I hadn't finished it because I was allowed to go back and add to it um, because Whoa. nothing I had written before changed. I mean, the, the research and everything that I'd written stayed the same. It was just, I was able to add the story and add my experience in the hospital, which was terrible um, to it. Uh, and I could probably make the book 25, 50% longer at this point, um, learning what I've yeah. learned since then. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that some people aren't aware of is that after the heart attack, well, first of all, I did very little of what they recommended um, based on my knowledge. And that was my personal decision. Um, and my heart completely recovered within three months. And then after the heart attack, because of a part of the procedure they did, which we can get into if you want, um, I developed uh, a narrowing or atherosclerosis of the artery in my leg which was restricting blood flow to the lower part of my leg. And I couldn't, I couldn't walk even, uh, definitely couldn't snowboard or play soccer or do all these things that I like to do. Um, and, you know, through doing things that I did, which was again, not their recommendations, uh, I completely reversed that as well. And uh, over a time, a span of two years, and um, I just had the, the second clear normal test for it uh, in May, that it's still normal. So, um, here I am being told that your heart will never recover. Your leg will never recover unless you rest and take all these medications, which I was told I would be on six medications for the rest of my life. Um, and uh, I did not do those things. And I did my own health things and use the information that I gained about the heart and heart disease. And I'm completely recovered. Um, and it was something that they said that they just don't see people recover from. Wow. Thanks for sharing all that. And I'm, I'm so curious about like, so you were already writing a book about the heart when you had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Was it, was the motivation to write about the heart because of all the fear that, you know, you kind of had been given your whole life of, you might end up having heart issues because of type one, like what was your motivation in writing the book in the first place? I guess that, yeah. So like, since I had been interested in the heart because of my, um, my likelihood to have heart right. disease as a type okay. one diabetic, at least that's what I told uh -huh. I had always researched it. Um, you know, I anything see. I could read about the heart and heart disease, right. I would pick up. Um, and there was a lot of misconceptions, you know, everything from the cholesterol theory of heart disease to the actual true function of the heart, which is not to move blood throughout the body, in my opinion, um, to why heart cancer is so rare, um, which is the rarest place of cancer uh, by far of any organ in the body and all these different interesting things that I had come across. And I was like, well, and I'd started sharing that on social media, some of it, and people seemed to like it. So I was like, well, I like to write. I'll, I'll write a book about it. Wow. Um, and then found myself in a situation where I had the heart attack and was able to, you know, use that as the introduction. Um, and, you know, the very short-sighted, very close-minded and, and shut down of conversation care that I received in the hospital was able to add that to, you know, this is how much we've misunderstood the heart, but also goes to show that you know, cause I was, I'd always been very strict about diet and ate whole food diets, um, mm -hmm. you know, various types of whole food diets, uh, yet still happened. So to me, one of my big missions today is heart disease is not just about diet. 
Um, and I would argue that it's not even the main contributor to heart disease diet, either being what pre- protects or prevents heart disease. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and it's much more about many other things, um, that, that can damage an artery and, and, and how heart attacks actually happen and that it's clotting material and has nothing to do with cholesterol. There's, there's so much, um, uh, nuance that I think is misunderstood about the whole process. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah. Mm. Um, in term, it feels like, like some sort of divine intervention, like <laughs> here, this is your purpose. Like, holy crap, <laughs> I can't believe that happened. Well, it and happened- you know, to that point, yes, like it's obviously a bad thing that happened. Um, and I wish that it hadn't happened, but right. the amount of people that connect with me now, because right. I've been through it and right. the amount of people that have come to me and I've been able to help because I've been through it mm. and the knowledge that I have that's been the most rewarding thing. And it's almost like, you know, it's hard to completely regret that it happened because mm-hmm. I'm helping change people's lives. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of us have been through painful experiences that have brought us into where we're at and can really relate with that. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of like, after it happened, you know, you acknowledge like, yeah, likely I was dehydrated, you know, probably salt, minerals, things were low. Um very stressed on top of stress, you know, um, was, were there any other things like after that happened, like, even if they were things you had already written about, but that like, after that happened, you were like, wow, this is really important. You know what I mean? Um, I think the main things that I was sort of aware of, but not necessarily practicing, um, was my, my infrared light exposure, um, at the time, which, naturally comes from the sun. Um, but I recruited an infrared sauna, um, mm-hmm. to do that, uh, as well. Uh, my contact with the earth, um, mm-hmm. grounding, I was not doing, um, a- as well as I should. Um, and then circadian rhythm was huge. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as something that I was not really, you know, aware of, but not fully practicing. practicing. Yeah. Um, and so, like I said, I'd always been, able to control diet, something I could do. I could control that. I control what I put in my mouth, other things where someone out of my control took more work. Um, and so, so yeah, I, you know, kind of learned the lesson there and knowing what I know now, which I'm happy to explain the mechanisms of, of why those things would prevent a heart attack. Um, but knowing what I know now, if I had been doing those things, I think I would have been protected, um, uh, from that, but you know, hindsight's 2020, I'm yeah. here today still and, yeah. and, uh, still doing, you know, what I think I should be doing. So it's all good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I definitely feel like it's a, everything happens for a reason kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I live in Hawaii now. Um, it's 70 something degrees year round. A really hot day is like low eighties, you know, <laughs> it's pretty nice weather wise here year round. I have never experienced that in my life before. And this, what you just talked about has been on my mind a lot in terms of how complicated we are making everything because we're just not out here. Mm-hmm. We're just not. And even me right now, like I'm on my deck, but I, you know, that's nice. I appreciate the bird sounds and the the breeze and seeing nature and being around nature. It's not the same as being in direct sunlight during parts of the day. It's not the same as when a day that I go and I'm in the ocean and I'm getting sun, I don't sleep the same. I don't feel the same, you know? And, um, I also don't eat the same, right? Like I think we all have experienced if you're on some camping trip or big outdoors thing, you're not like sitting there, like hiding in a corner, like binging on Reese's cups, you know, Mm -hmm. you're like in a much healthier flow with your, your hunger and satiety. Um, mood, energy, sleep like a baby, you know? And so I love that you're hitting on this topic. It's been so on my mind since moving here. Um, And also circadian rhythm is something that I've really like, you know, gotten into really made a part of my life since like 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can't even believe like I'm trying to like, I'm like from the rooftops. I'm like, dude, if you will just <laughs> go to bed about the same time every night and then like wake up and like get the sun in your eyes and like have some slow in the morning and then mm-hmm. like kind of intermittent fast stress and let yourself come back down again. And like, it's so good, you know? Mm-hmm. So let's, let's go on this. Um, and yeah. And talking about your um, perspective in terms mm-hmm. of how that impacts the heart. Yeah. Well, you know, when you talk about heart disease, there's lots of different categories. You know, there's atherosclerosis, which is plaque forming in the arteries. There's heart attacks or cardiac arrests. 
uh, there's um, heart failure, there's heart arrhythmias. And the main one that people are that talk about a lot is atherosclerosis, like when we get plaque formation on the arteries. So, um, and people think that that is what eventually causes heart attacks. You know, most cardiologists think that that is what eventually causes heart attacks. And I disagree. Um, mm. I don't think that that's the case. And I'm happy to explain why. Um, so let's talk about coronary arteries. So, and, you know, damage to an artery can happen anywhere in the body. Um, and when damage happens, if the repair mechanisms aren't robust enough, or there's insulin resistance or things interfering with the repair mechanisms, then the body has to do something to repair the artery. Um, and that is um, lay down clotting tissue. Uh, just like if you cut your skin, cut mm -hmm. your arm, like your body has to form a scab to stop the bleeding. So if the inside of an artery is damaged, it has to lay down this clotting tissue. When you analyze atherosclerosis um, in people on autopsy and um, and uh, and uh, people are alive, it's it's like 87% plus or minus 8% clotting tissue, um, uh, according to one study. And so that's what happens when we have damage. Uh, there's very little cholesterol present. Um, and cholesterol does get involved in the process at some point, but it's mainly because it's involved in the process of creating clotting tissue, um, or it gets caught up in the, the, uh, the process as it's forming clotting tissue. So, um, so we have to ask ourselves what causes clotting tissue, what causes, um, clotting to happen. And so back in 1856, Rudolf Virchow, uh, determined that what causes clotting is when we get damage to the lining of an artery when we get uh, poor, stagnant, or interrupted blood flow, um, or when we get elements of blood clumping together. Okay, so, and those have held true in medicine since that time. Those are the things that cause pathologic clotting in, in the blood uh, bloodstream in the arteries. And so, um, if we look at uh, what's called structured water uh, in the body, uh, which structured water uh, is is water in a kind of fourth state. We all know that water is solid liquid gas. So we can have it in ice, water, or steam, but there's actually a fourth state in which it can exist, and that is more like a gel. Uh, so you can think like jello or the consistency of raw egg white, kind of that gelatinous sponginess. And most of the water in our body is in this state, which is why if you touch the muscle of your forearm, it kind of gives and bounces back because it's a gel, just like jello or congealed bone broth. Um, and so this does this water does form in the lining of the arteries. So structured water will form in any situation where the water is energized, uh, which means it 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 holds energy energy from infrared light, um, or uh, and it's next to a hydrophilic surface, uh, which means a water loving surface. So hydrophobic would mean like fat droplets that are in water, they're hydrophobic, so they stick together away from the water. Hydrophilic means it loves water. And so next to a hydrophilic surface, water, quote unquote, structures itself into this gel-like form. And that happens on the lining of the arteries. And this has been proven uh, in uh, Dr. Gerald Pollock's lab at University of Washington. Uh, and there's many, many scientists before Dr. Pollock that have discovered um, or come across structured water. And they've called it many different things because they all discovered it at different times. Um, and so this structured water does three very, very important things uh, for us in the arteries. One, structured water has also been nicknamed exclusion zone water because it performs like an almost impenetrable barrier. So if it's next to the lining of the arteries, nothing can really touch the arteries if we have intact, healthy, structured water there. Um, also, so that's Virchow's strategy number one, protect the arteries, prevent damage from the arteries. We build structured water. And then uh, the second thing that it does is that because of the way structured water forms, structured water is very electronegatively charged. And because it cleaves off a hydrogen, which is very positively charged, then it lines up next to that electro that negatively charged area, and we get a positive area next to a negative area, and that's a battery. Um, that's what we know. When we put a battery in something, we have to align the charges. Um, and so that actually creates energy. And so they've actually put electrodes from a light bulb into the positive and negative end of structured water, and it powers the light bulb. Uh, and so in the artery this energy that's created with that situation actually does the work of moving fluid, um, which is why we don't necessarily need a forcefully pumping heart to move blood in tubes because the blood is about half water. 
And this is the mechanism by which it moves. And they've actually proven this. I have a really fascinating video from Dr. Pollock's lab on my computer that shows that this is happening after the heart has stopped moving, the blood continues to flow. And so that's Birchow's triad number two. We create blood flow when we prevent stagnant blood flow. And then the, the third thing that it does is that structured water also forms on elements of blood, like red blood cells and lipoproteins and anything in the blood. And so since uh, structured water forms on those and it's very electronegatively charged, then all the elements of blood should have a negative charge and negative or like charges don't like each other. They repel. So nothing sticks together, right? They all stay evenly spaced in the blood. And so that's Birchow's triad number three mm. is we keep elements of blood from sticking together. So if people are familiar with an erythrocyte sedimentation rate test, uh, ESR, it's a, it's a marker of how um, readily elements of blood like red blood cells stick together. So if you have a high era uh, ESR that's, um, you know, clumps together, it's it's measuring that it's clumping together too fast. You have low structured water in your arteries mm -hmm. um, because they're clumping together. And so if we want to prevent clotting, which is ultimately what atherosclerosis is, and it's what the end result of stroke or heart attack, it's a clotting issue, a clot forms, then we need to put ourselves in an environment that encourages structured water to form. Uh, and that is, like you talked about, nature, the things that build structured water and energize water so that it uh, structures itself on biological surfaces is sunlight or infrared light mainly, but all colors and wavelengths of light will do it. Um, uh, grounding, being in direct contact with the earth, have been shown to increase the structured water on red blood cells. Um, we talk about being in natural bodies of water. That's the ultimate grounding uh, right there because you're totally immersed in it. Um, just moving your body, especially to the point of creating heat, uh, structures water and creates a piezoelectric effect that builds electrons uh, that structure water in the body. So like, you know, being in nature, the sounds of nature uh, will will do it too. Um, all this, like we're removing ourselves from that. So you talked about like how, you know, you notice a difference just from sitting on your deck there or being immersed in nature, you notice the difference there. Imagine someone who is sitting in an office under artificial light, uh, surrounded by electromagnetic fields, eating artificial food. Like it's just, oh, it's man. just like the terrible, the most wrong environment for the human body mm -hmm. to do these things. It's like, oh. no wonder we have this epidemic right. of heart disease. Now, <laughs> just to take it further and why I don't believe that atherosclerosis is causing heart attacks is because when this happens, this say we do get damage to the lining of the artery in a coronary artery, which that happens most commonly in coronary arteries because they're under the most pressure of any artery. So if there is things that damage the artery, it's pushed up against the lining of the artery more because of that pressure. Um, and so that can damage the structured water and then damage the calyx, then damage the endothelia and the artery. And then when that gets damaged, then uh, we get clotting tissue forming. And that happens more so in type 2 diabetics because they're insulin resistant. And when they're insulin resistant, uh, that impairs repair mechanisms. So now not only is the damage happening, the repair can't happen. And so the body has to deposit clotting tissue, almost like spackle, trying to patch it up, you know? Yeah. And so if that happens, you know, it can create this stenosis or narrowing of an artery like because it can slowly grow like that. And the thought is, that um, that uh, stenosis, that plaque can become damaged and rupture, right? And if it ruptures, the body has a clotting response and it blocks the artery. Um, however, there's a really interesting paper called The Myth of the Vulnerable Plaque, um, mm -hmm. written in 2015. And it goes through all the literature based on this vulnerable plaque theory. And basically, at the end of the paper, they determine that there's not much evidence for it. And they say that plaque ruptures do indeed happen. But... Uh, their their number is 0.06% of the time does it result in heart attack. Wow. Um, so lots of times the plaque ruptures and the body just puts a fibrous cap on it and the, the stenosis grows, right? Hmm. Now, the other theory is that the stenosis gets big enough and, and it narrows the artery enough that there's very little blood flow. However, the work of Giorgio Baraldi, uh, who wrote a whole book on his findings, his, his lifelong work uh, of his findings, found that, and he did multiple autopsies on multiple hearts. And he, you ever been to like the body world exhibits um, or the animals inside out where they do like dissections of the body and there's uh, those cool things like that. Well, there's a technique in there where like they, they dissolve, like they, they inject the arterial system of different animals oh, or okay, organs yeah. with yeah. a plastic material. 
and then the plastic mm-hmm. material hardens and then it dissolves mm-hmm. away all the rest of the tissue with hydrochloric acid and they're left with this arterial system. And he invented that cool. or all the invented okay. that cool. procedure to study hearts. Mm-hmm. Um, and what he found though, is that anywhere there was a more than 60 or 70% narrowing of an artery in the heart, the body had built a vast network of collaterals around it to oh, bypass wow. it. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, I always talk about, you know, in Jurassic Park when Dr. Malcolm says, oh, and life will find a way, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. that's kind of what's happening. Wow. And so, um, you know, sometimes the collaterals or form, uh, they form enough that they, they're always form enough to keep you alive, but sometimes they're, you know, uh, not so robust and people can have chest pain still, but, um, but it, there's some cases, uh, case studies that Dr. Tim Noakes talks about where people run marathons on collateral artery circulation. They have a hundred percent blockage of an artery and they still run a marathon because they have collateral circulation. Um, and what dictates how well the collaterals form is blood flow. So again, that's putting yourself back into that environment that creates structured water and creates blood flow. Mm -hmm. And then, so the collateral arteries, they help us understand why when you look at all the studies and I've looked and looked and looked at all these studies about bypass procedures in elective stent placements, like stent placements where they do an angiogram, they see a 50% narrowing and they put a stent in electively, not during a heart attack, but electively. Um, if you look at those studies, I have yet to find a study that shows that they're beneficial. Um, they all say that whether you have the procedure or not, you're just as likely to have a heart attack in the long run. Wow. And it's because if you have collateral arteries, stenting that stenosis isn't going to help. You've already got collateral saturation. Building a bypass and around it with a vein from your leg isn't going to help. You've already got collateral circulation. Wow. The issue with heart attacks is clotting. It's mm-hmm. not these stenoses. Um, and so Western medicine has made a lot of money treating the stenosis, treating the narrowing of the artery, but they're not doing anything to prevent clotting. They're not putting anything with body in any sort of environment to prevent clotting besides taking blood thinners which eventually have long-term side effects of mineral depletion and excess mm-hmm. bleeding. Um, so that's that's my spiel on heart disease and well, coronary heart disease, you know, atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries. Um, and it's I've kind of put it all together with a lot of different research that I've read, um, but it makes sense uh, what happened to me and it makes sense of what happens to a lot of people and what we see uh, in literature. Wow, that was super enlightening. Thank you. Um, let's hit cholesterol. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, so, I mean, maybe your followers are familiar with the Ansel Keys story, um, and how, you know, I would think a lot of them, but just in case quick. Yeah, for sure. So, (laughs) you know, back in the fifties, uh, Eisenhower famously had a heart attack in the Oval Office and heart disease was on the rise, which should be the first red flag right there. We've been eating animal foods for, um, since since however long you believe humans have been on this earth, we've been eating animal foods. And there's even evidence that I talk about in my book that it was the diet that made us human. Uh, we ate a high amount of animal foods. Um, and so, you know, heart disease has been a relatively new thing. Like in the 19, early 1900s, the, um, the American cardiology, uh, I mean, just wasn't a thing. There was very few cardiologists. It just wasn't mm. needed. And then in the 50s, it started to rise. Uh, heart disease started to rise. And so people were looking for an answer. And this one scientist, Dr. Ansel Keys, um, gave people an answer. Uh, He did these studies where he looked at amounts of cholesterol and saturated fat eaten in different countries. And he compared it to rates of heart disease. And he said, look, the more saturated fat and cholesterol people eat, the more heart disease we have. However, he, there was data from 22 countries available at the time. And he took the data from the six countries that he that gave him the correlation that he wanted. Um, and then later he did it, he repeated it again with seven countries. And then I think it was maybe five or 10 years later, uh, two other scientists repeated the study and used all 22 countries available at the time. And they found no correlation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. However, the real problem is that these are correlation studies. They're not causation. So you can't, you can't show causation from these things. So basically these types of studies are the lowest form of research and they're on the, the bottom of the pyramid for a reason. Um, and what they do, all they can do is show that two things are happening at the same time, but they can't show that one is really causing the other. So it's like yeah. if I'm standing on the sidewalk and I see a traffic jam in front of me and I also see that it's cloudy, I can't right. say that the traffic jams cause the clouds or the clouds cause the traffic right. jam. You just can't make that assumption. Right. And that's what 
these studies were, and that's what most of our nutrition research is, is based on those studies because it's very expensive to do nutrition randomized controlled trials. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're based on these types of things. Um, and so, and there was lots of, I guess, questionable things that happened when they tested the theory, which there was five or six big major trials that actually tested the theory uh, of saturated fat causing heart disease. They replaced saturated fat in the diet with unsaturated fat. And in all those studies, they found that the more unsaturated fat people ate, the more heart disease they had, the more all-cause mortality from anything they had. And so those studies were kind of hush-hushed and pushed aside and not published in big journals like they should have been um, or published much later than they should have been. Um, and so it was kind of – and the reason that is is because there was a lot of money behind the idea that saturated fat and cholesterol – cause heart disease. That was the big push because companies saw an opportunity, um, you know, to like, if you can convince the world that saturated fat uh, and animal foods cause heart disease, then the cereal, sugar, grain industries could all make a lot of money from that. Breakfast was invented pretty much, you know, mm -hmm. and the breakfast cereal was invented. Um, and then if you can convince the world that cholesterol causes heart disease, pharmaceutical companies uh, could uh, now sell more drugs because they have a drug that lowers cholesterol. Uh, and that's the number one, number two, every year prescribed drug in the United States is a statin drug. Um, and so, but the results of that, of that approach is that heart disease has continued to rise consistently since that time. So that's having no or little effect. So in my opinion, cholesterol is a complete wild goose chase um, and it's, and we're barking up the wrong tree. Um, it's, it literally tells us almost nothing about risk of heart disease, in my opinion, looking at mm -hmm. lipids on a blood panel, um, blood work in general can be seen as kind of a hyper reality, but mm -hmm. all cholesterol tells us is what our bodies are choosing to metabolize at the time. So if we are more of a sugar burner, a glucose burner, then our body is taking that glucose and turning it into triglycerides and our triglycerides can be higher in the blood. And because our body is trying to deliver the glucose in the form of triglycerides, converting it to triglycerides to the tissues. If we are burning more fats, um, then our body is packaging those fats into LDL and our body and our LDL can go up and because our body is trying to deliver that energy to the cells. So that's why people, some people on low carb or ketogenic diets have very elevated LDL because uh, what Dave Feldman is called lean mass hyper responders um, because they're trying to deliver lots of energy. Um, and so, but there seems to be no difference in risk uh, and Dave Feldman and in the work that he's doing is showing that very clearly now. Um, and then there's actually a really interesting study or just a, you know, pretty much a one person experiment done by a scientist at Harvard where he tested this. He's a ketogenic diet and he has high LDL on that diet. And then he ate, six Oreos a day or something like that, or maybe twice a day, and the LDL dropped significantly. And then he did the same thing. He went back on his low-carb diet, and his uh -huh. LDL went back up, and he took a statin drug. And the Oreos were more effective than the statin drug. So oh. <laughs> by that by that experiment, which is just a one-person experiment, and they <laughs> could right. do a bigger experiment, yeah. but by that, if, if, if cholesterol causes heart disease, then we should all be eating Oreos to lower our wow. cholesterol which wow. we know it sounds ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's been a complete distraction from what the actual mm -hmm. causes of heart disease are. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's so freaked out about their cholesterol and their numbers and they're trying to overanalyze cholesterol. And now they're talking about all these different subfractions of cholesterol. It doesn't matter how you slice it up. I mean, Einstein said that, you know, we can't solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. Wow. So I don't care how you measure cholesterol. It's not going to give us the answer. The right. answer is the structured water, go back into nature, the things we talked about. That's what we're deficient in. We're deficient in that stuff. Nature. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I looked into this myself. My mom passed away this past November and she had type two diabetes for mm -hmm. a while. She had some early dementia. You know, we, we could tell there was some dementia going on. And I've, I haven't even said this ever um, to my audience or anything, but I was going through my voicemails. I had a bunch of voicemails from my mom that I hadn't deleted and like, it was like the second most recent one from when she passed and her voice went from like her normal kind of sweet little like voice, you know, to 
completely slurred speech couldn't understand what she was saying at all and mm. you could but you can make it out if you really listen and she's saying my doc my doctor said i have to get back on these statins i don't like these statins i don't like the way they make me feel but he said i have to take them and my mom had a stroke like you know, a month later now i'm not saying that that's like why or whatever but it's like okay yeah that really helped you know mm. it didn't it didn't help anything she had a yeah. stroke because she had type 2 diabetes and a lot of things going on for a long time and she had a really stressful event and that's what happened you know and um she she didn't this was a long time ago she passed yeah. she didn't pass away from that stroke but it definitely mm. did her in like she kind of was gone it was the first phase of my mom being gone you know um yeah. and I just, I don't know. And, and even if you just look into statins and if you just even look into this research, it's just like over and over and over. It's not cholesterol is it, it, just look into it. If you, if this is an area in your own personal health, just actually go read studies and and see yourself or just go to Dave Feldman's work and mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of like point you in the right direction. Yeah. And you also, um, and, um, yeah, the, I wanted to see if you could talk about your cholesterol, a little mm. bit during your healing journey. <laughs> yeah. So here I'll tell this story then. So, um, so after, uh, the heart attack, they did a heart cath and they went into the leg and, uh, the artery in my leg and my groin to go up and place the stent, which I could argue they may or may not have needed to, but it's hindsight. Like they saved my life. I'm grateful for them. Yeah. They did what they had to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm still here. So, but they placed the stent and then, so that slit that they made in my leg there uh, in the artery, they sealed it up with a device called the angio seal. Um, and the reason they use that is because it allows the artery to heal quicker. So for most people, for a lot of people laying stagnant in a bed, which for like 36, 48 hours to try and let that artery heal is a problem because you get clotting, right? Um, may or may not have been a problem for me um, as you know, in the health that I was in, um, but they used it. And so I could sit up within 12 hours, right? However, that device, like here's the lumen of the artery, the device sits on the inside of it like this. So it's kind of like on a river when water's flowing past a rock and it kind of eddies on the other side, right? So it disrupts blood flow. And what happened was about two months after the heart attack, when I started being active again, uh, I was walking and I developed this pain in my leg. Um, and I didn't know what it was. I was like, what is this? I could deep vein thrombosis. Am I getting compartment syndrome? What is going on? Um, and then I eventually figured out that there was a, well, the testing showed 75 to 99% stenosis blockage of the blood flow to my lower leg um, because of the disrupted blood flow from that angio seal. At least that's my interpretation of it. And I found research that shows that, that, that it can disrupt blood flow and it does, it could do that, even though yeah. the vascular surgeons were like, no, no, it's not the case, uh, whatever. Um, I don't understand how it couldn't be. Literally, I did a sprint yeah. workout the morning right. I had the heart attack. My leg was fine. And right. it's the same leg they did the procedure on. Like, right. <laughs> this is this is adding up here. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, we decided not to, not to do anything about it because it wasn't affecting my day-to-day. -day. It was just I couldn't do the things, some things I enjoy, like snowboard or play soccer or be as yeah. active as I usually am. Yeah. Um, and But they say when we start messing with them, they usually get worse. So we just left it alone. And so I started doing my things, which I was already kind of doing for the heart, which is lots of infrared sauna, lots of sunlight, lots of grounding, lots of circadian rhythm stuff. Those are the big four things that I that I changed. And um, and my diet stayed the same. My stress, unfortunately, stayed about the same um, for a little while after that. Um, and most other parts of my lifestyle stayed the same. A year after that first test, um, doing lots of sauna, probably six days a week, lots of sunlight, all that stuff. Um, the the stenosis in that artery had dropped to 50% um, on the second test. And they actually, the technician came back in and said, we're going to test it again because I don't know if this is right. And they tested it again. It was still 50% 50, 50, 50 narrowed. Um, and the vascular surgeon at that point said, well, we can't say that it's better because we just don't see these things get better. Um, and I was like, well, the testing just showed that it's not 99% blocked. Now it's 50% blocked. So then a year later, I came back. The test was completely normal. Um, there was no stenosis of that artery. There was no restriction in blood flow into my leg. And I thought that was going to be the case because about two months prior to that test, I played soccer, um, just tried it out. And I was able to uh, for about an hour 
uh, mm. just with some family and friends. And so I was like, well, this is indicative that something's better. Um, and then just a few months ago, I had the last test um, and it's still normal. So it's been normal for over a year now. Um, and the device is still in there. So I would imagine that if I stopped doing these things that were healing my artery, then it would it may come back. Um, but that was the only thing I changed. And I'm telling the story because you asked about my cholesterol. And during this entire process of reversing atherosclerosis, which is supposedly caused by cholesterol, right? My cholesterol was much higher than what is recommended. It was um, mostly in the two to three hundreds, um, but there's times when it was over 500. Um, so I reversed atherosclerosis with levels much higher than it's supposed to be, supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. so, which tells you, tells me, an end of one experiment that it is not about cholesterol. That is mm -hmm. not what causes this. It's about, really it's about energy. It's about lack of energy to the system. Um, and when there's lack of energy, which that energy is held in structured water, when there's lack of energy to the system, the system suffers. And the vascular system takes the hit first because it's where everything is transported. It's where something is constantly moving through it, which creates friction. Um, so that's that's the answer. That's what's causing heart disease is those things there. And when you do things to build structured water and protect the arteries, they're allowed to heal. And mine did. Um, so I don't know. How else to put it, you know? Yeah. I'm curious, your sauna, is it like red light, near infrared, far infrared, or like what what is in there? So far infrared sauna is what I use. Um, okay. And as far as I know, the one I have emits the highest amount of far infrared. Um, okay. Uh, and so that's why I got that one. Um, but near infrared, like far mm -hmm. infrared, according to Dr. Pollock's lab is the most structuring to water. You'll get the okay. biggest amount of structured water if you use far infrared, which is the farthest wavelength from the sun or uh, on the spectrum of the sun. It uh -huh. goes far infrared all the way to UV. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's visible light in the middle. Uh, so the 3000 nanometer wavelength, um, mm -hmm. but near infrared will do it. Mm -hmm. Red light will do it. So even people who have red light panels and near infrared panels, like those are mm -hmm. hugely beneficial too. The sun is always yeah. best. Yeah. Even yeah. blue light will do it. Blue light, well, blue light and the study that says this kind of stuff is all it always says blue light in uh what does it say? Blue light um in natural quantities or at real yeah. world doses is what it says, which right. means nice. which means balanced sun. by other colors of light. Right. You know, it's never supposed to be on its own, like these right. artificial blue lights that we have or LED screens that right. we have, right? right. Um, so, so yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I mean, it, there's rainbows for a reason. Like, you know, like it's a little reminder. Like, <laughs> yeah, all you're the in light, Hawaii, it's rainbows the, everywhere. Like, yeah, there are a lot of rainbows, you know, and it's always a wonderful reminder of like, you know, I am someone who geeks out on sunlight and circadian rhythm and nature and and how important it is for health. And I see these rainbows and it's just like, it looks like this little like mother nature reminder of like all these light spectra, all these colors are here in these rays, just in case you were wanting yeah. to know. <laughs> just letting you know. And we're going to make it really pretty for you too. That's right, <laughs> but yeah. little, little information for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. I think, you know, as I reflect on a lot of things you're saying, I have... I guess, compassion in certain ways for people who are stuck in the Western medicine model. Um, this whole, like, I, I admit sometimes, you know, I saw you made a post about this too. Like, why aren't doctors mercurious, you know? And I, mm -hmm. I think that all the time I'm like, you know, I'll get in my little fits and I'm like, how can you have all these people coming in with hypothyroidism and just be like, here's your medication and not be like, I wonder why all these people have hypothyroid, like why? And then I grow up a little and I remember that they are stuck in a system that it takes a lot of courage and like, scary financial decisions and all sorts of things to ever get out of, right? Mm -hmm. You're in this nice cushy system of like big pharma's contributing to everything, the insurance company, you're like in that system and it'd be a lot to get out of. And so I have compassion. And also mm -hmm. I'm also really grateful for 
um, all the functional medicine doctors, you know, like I call this area, like the revenge of the chiropractors, you know, (laughs) like chiropractors used to get so much garbage. And now like a lot of them have become more functional medicine doctors and are bringing up really cool, interesting uh, conversations like this and looking at things from more of the root cause angle than the treatment angle. And so I'm like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, chiropractors <laughs> historically like they took a lot of heat from medicine, yes. but there's, there was actually a there was actually a committee put together by the American Medical Association to disband chiropractic. Um, right. Yeah, and and they you know uh, wrongfully accused chiropractors of practicing medicine without a license and did all this stuff and jailed a lot of chiropractors. And, jailed? Uh, oh yeah, they went to jail wow. for pretty much wow. no reason. Um, and they um, yeah, it was it was crazy and. It was all because medicine saw it as a threat. They saw yeah. them as a threat to their product, right? Uh, which was modern medicine, and that all happened with Rockefeller Medicine back in the you know early 1900s. Um, and then eventually, a Supreme Court, um, actually, I don't know if it was Supreme Court. It may have been Supreme Court um, ruling ruled that that committee by the American Medical Association was unconstitutional, and they were to cease and desist immediately. Um, and stop, you know, uh, these wrongful accusations about chiropractors. Wow. They were just practicing chiropractic. They're not practicing, you know, mm-hmm. out of their scope of practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so yeah, it's just interesting that we kind of got that legal retribution. And then, yeah, now you can say we're coming around and we're the ones that, and other practitioners too, not just chiropractors, naturopaths, all kinds yeah. of different practitioners. Mm-hmm. We're the ones that are now learning these alternative things. We're like, okay, right. how do we figure out how to heal people? Like, mm-hmm. it's not just about this or that. We're not dogmatic. And then like right. you say, yeah, unfortunately, even if you know a medical doctor does start to question things, there's so many things keeping them in that model. Right. Um, you know, just you know, preventing them from getting outside that box unless they take certain risks. Um, you know, that could be a risk against their livelihood, which, you know, they like making what they make. Uh, they right. worked hard to get there. Medical school is not easy. Um, or well, And they're so busy. Yeah. It's like, or when are they mm-hmm. even supposed to have time to think? Yeah, by the you time know? they get done with their day, they're just like, I'm going to go home and chill. Right. Uh, time to think about anything else. Um, <laughs> and it's funny, a lot of the medical doctors that do come around, obviously, it, it, or lots of times it's like, toward their retirement, they finally get some time and they're like, oh, this didn't make sense. Um, so, but it's just that system, you know, set up mm-hmm. and it's, and it's set up that way for profit. And, you know, yeah. I, you know, people have trouble with that sometimes. And I kind of choose, even though I know a lot of things, I kind of choose not to feel that it's nefarious, even though sometimes I, I have yeah. information that tells me that it is, yeah. but all I can say is that for people is that you just have to be aware of it. And then make decisions yeah. based on that information. That's all right. you can do. Um, right. Instead of getting all pissed off and angry about that, it's going to be that way. All right. you can do is take that information and make the best decision for you uh-huh. going forward. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 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 And I think, you know, anybody in the functional world in any way, shape or form is like, yeah, if I got in a car accident, like, thank God, you know, for Western medicine, it's yeah. like um, emergency rooms are so important. Thank you. You know? Um, and you know, sure. Even some of those pharmaceutical drugs, somebody's like writhing and freaking pain, their whole body just got smashed. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, grateful for all that for them. You know, it's amazing what (laughs) modern medicine can do. I actually, I actually just recorded a post today, um, about this very thing that like in a medical emergency, Western medicine in a Westernized country is the absolute best place. They can do amazing things. Totally. With, like if you have a heart attack, like in my situation, or you have traumas, totally. or you have a life-threatening bacterial infection, something like that. Right. Like amazing totally. things. But so, as soon yeah. as you're stable, as soon yeah. as you're stable and there's no threat of going uh, back into being unstable, it's the worst place to be. Yeah. That environment is the worst place for healing. The artificial mm-hmm. light the nat- unnatural uh, EMFs, the food they serve, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, no contact with nature. Uh, their only method is medications, which oftentimes, you know, they can be needed, but oftentimes they're making things worse. Like mm-hmm. it's the worst environment to be mm-hmm. as soon as you're stable. It's crazy how it, how it shifts mm-hmm. like that. It's just boom, instantly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's kind of like the Western food system too, like in terms of what's r- allowed or not, like essentially I see it the same way. If it's not going to kill you like immediately, like you ate that and dropped dead that day, Unless it's that, it's all good. If we kind of know it's going to kill you eventually, like, no, we're not too worried about that. I just, you know, want to cover our butts in case it. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> kills crazy. you. So we don't want to be liable. <laughs> but, <laughs> but long-term liability, that's going to be hard to figure out. So we won't worry about that too much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind it's of the great. same way. <laughs> um, all right. Um, God, did, did we hit on all your, th- we hit on our um, atherosclerosis and also mm-hmm. um, cholesterol. Yeah. Was there any other aspect of the heart? I mean, that- if you want to go into how the heart's not a pump, we could do that. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's the main thinking that, you know, because the heart's this contracting organ, that it must be this forceful pressure propulsion pump that's moving the blood throughout the body. Uh, and there's actually a large body of evidence that that is not the case. Um, some of it logical, uh, some of it being that, you know, a heart that size, uh, there's no way that it could forcefully pump the amount of fluid that we have in our blood um, around the body, uh, just the physics of it or the energetics of it, like the uh, the yeah. amount of energy it would take to do that. We would need a heart. Mm. There's some scientists say the heart the size of a whale to do that, wow. um, a whale's heart. Um, and so, yeah, plus like, Logically, it doesn't make sense. If I was going to pump something up a hill, like from my yeah. feet back to the heart, I wouldn't place the pump at the top of the hill. I'd place right. it at the bottom to push it up, right? So that doesn't quite make sense. And it turns out that the heart is not this pressure propulsion pump um, and that it has three roles in the body that um, are uh, what I think are, are what it's for. Um, one is to vortex the blood. So we've talked about how blood moves without the need of a pumping heart. Um and so one way that water can become energized um, so that it can form structured water and then form on the lining of the arteries and then move um, the blood. Uh, and you also have to think about lymphatic fluid. There's no pump there, but that fluid right. moves. Yeah. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid is the same way. Um, water in the roots of a tree somehow gets up to the leaves. There's no pump there. Um, yeah. And it's all moving by this mechanism. Um, and so the heart because it's the way that it's oriented, it's one actually one big band of muscle that's wrapped up on itself. And so when a heart contracts, it kind of, the signal goes around like that and it spirals and it goes like this. Right, um, right. And so that vortex is, it creates these vortices, which is like a, if you have like a two liter oh. bottle of water and you spin it around, it creates that vortex in the middle. Um, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. So in Dr. Right. Pollock's lab, they've shown that vortexing water energizes it. Um, so that's what one role of the heart is to energize it so that it can move the blood later. Um, The other role is that there's actually research that shows that it actually slows the flow of blood. The heart slows it because if during exertion, the blood or the body or the tissues want more uh, oxygen and nutrients to the tissues while we're exercising and all the blood would go over to the arterial side and flood over there and just, you know, um, um, uh, super saturated and the venous side wouldn't have enough fluid to maintain the pressure and it would collapse. Um, and so the heart actually at times of exertion slows the flow of blood, which is why athletes, uh, endurance athletes can get, you know, um, growth of the heart because it's actually more effective at slowing the flow of blood. And there's very interesting studies done on soccer players wow. that show this. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, pumping it more, um, endurance athletes, it's actually slowing the flow more, um, because of their activities. And so that's the second one. It maintains the pressure between the two systems so it doesn't collapse. And then the third and most fascinating to me role of the heart is that, you know, uh, the work of like the HeartMath Institute has showed us that every organ has an electromagnetic field and or emits an electromagnetic field, just like every human does. And, uh, but every organ has their own and the heart's electromagnetic field is the largest of any organ in the body. Um, Like they say, it's estimate up to 5,000 times stronger than the brain's which you would think would be the highest electromagnetic uh, organ, but it's actually the heart because of its density of mitochondria. And Mm -hmm. that electromagnetic field is what is sensing our external environment as well as our internal environment. And based on how well we are connected and communicating to our external environment and how well our internal environment is communicating with itself, which means Mm -hmm. fascia and cellular communication, that's communicating uh, or the state of that communication is communicating coherence to the heart. And the heart is then communicating coherent or incoherent signals to the brain. And the brain is responding accordingly by telling the body, okay, we're in a stress or non-stress state because of this coherence or incoherence. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's actually fascinating research that shows that this is what's happening. Um, And so the heart is a sensory organ that's sensing those states 
as well as our emotional state, which is why we say things like, I love you with all my heart, or I gave it all my heart. There's just emotion behind this. Well, we don't say I love you with all my brain right. or all my spleen or whatever. Um, we say heart um, and because it has this emotional connection. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's more communication from the heart to the brain than there is brain to the heart. Um, mm -hmm. because, and that's the way it is for most organs, because the brain is just a processing center. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just interpreting all the signals uh, that we're getting from our sensory environment. We have way more than five senses and we sense that stuff, the brain interprets it and then tells the body how to react according to that. Um, so that's the three roles of the heart, um, none of which are to forcefully move blood throughout the body. Wow. I love all this talk. Ron Joda spends a fan too. So now I'm all like, my yeah. mind's all going all over the place. Um, <laughs> by the way, this is super random, but I just had to say, I literally, like, I just was getting something in my email and it has to do with Dr. Gerald Pol Pollock, right? <laughs> um, there's a, do you know Victor Sokolovsky, Lightwater Scientific? Oh, no. you need to know him. You know, um, uh, Robert Slovak, right? The water yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. So, um, if for listeners like the King Kington, I don't know, Quentin mm -hmm. Kington, mm -hmm. I think Waters, that's Robert Slovak. And then Victor Sogolovsky is, you would love, you would like him a whole Sounds bunch. Like um, it. He's a uh, light water with Robert Slovak. And yeah, so it's a water company. And he talks about deuterium depletion a lot. Anyway, yeah. super mm -hmm. cool dude. Uh, but he's doing a symposium. I just got this. It's got Dr. Jack Cruz, Dr. Gerald Pro Pol Pollock, um, a oh. bunch of people Tracy does. She's awesome. Yeah. So if anybody Sounds wants like to Sounds like a water go, conference. And, yeah, it's a water conference. Uh, it's yeah. called Water Symposium. It's in uh, watersymposium.com if anybody wants to check that out. I'm cool. pretty pumped about it. I think I'm managing a or doing like a panel or something. It looks like I just saw that on there. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I will find Congrats. out. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, is this supposed to be on here? Was that an accident? Um, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. So um, there was one other thing I wanted to hit on. Oh, stretching. I just want to bring this up. Mm. Um, have you, I have been, I've been geeking out on stretching so hard. I have been going on like a stretching, like bonanza crazy. It's like stretch fest 2024 over here. And it has been so eye opening. Like I've always like stretched here and there, but I'm talking like, I've been stretching way more than I've been working out. Like it's been mm. like, I'll go to the gym and just walk and then just like go on a crazy stretch bender. And then I get home and I'm like stretching, you know, and I have been feeling so freaking good. And it has taken me on this huge thing with blood flow and nutrient delivery mm. and not just range of motion. And it has landed me on cardiovascular benefits of stretching. So have you, have you gotten onto this one yet or looked into that? I, I didn't realize like there was a study showing not that long ago, you probably know that, that, um, it showed that stretching was more effective at lowering blood pressure than, than walking mm -hmm. than cardiovascular exercise. Are you, are mm -hmm. you familiar with this already? Yeah. Well, and it's the same <laughs> with like, they've shown that with like yoga for a long time, um, yeah. which yoga is a little more intense than just stretching, you know, um, uh, or it can be. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, the, the, the idea there, um, so this is kind of a, it's kind of an abstract thing, or there's a lot to put together. So when we talk about coherence, we're talking about, there's different ways you can communicate it, but, um, one of the ways is internal body communication. Um, so that means, uh, cells being able to sync up and communicate with each other. Uh, and they do that in multiple ways. One way they do it is through our fascia system. Uh, the fascia network of the body. And so uh, the fascia network is not just this connective tissue that holds things together. It's literally interwoven and goes all the way down to the level of the DNA and then all the mm -hmm. way out to the level of what we think of gross fascia when we, you know, like uh, dissect something, we see the connective tissue. Um, mm -hmm. And it's this, it's actually a communication highway. So uh, fascia is made of, uh, you know, collagen protein and the collagen is actually surrounded by structured water if it's hydrated properly and that makes it like a semiconducting wire like the copper wire in your wall and so electrons can pass through that and that uh, allows cells to communicate and pass information uh, one way there's that so communicate electromagnetically and through light and through free radicals and things like that um, but when we gently stretch um, like when we compress so like if you're getting like a massage and people are compressing mm -hmm. your fascia or you're stretching fascia putting tension on it in different ways it creates a piezoelectric effect um which literally creates electrons 
uh, through that stretch or compression. And when you create those electrons, it one, breaks up scar tissue, and two, which scar tissue is dehydrated fascia, fascia without structured water on it. Um, and it creates uh, electrons that are passed down um, that collagen all the way down to the level of cells. And so what that's doing is creating more coherent, it's creating more body communication, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. what is high blood pressure? High blood pressure is a um, it's an issue with the wrong signaling to the body. The body is getting a signal to increase blood pressure, usually in response to what people would say is autonomic imbalance, right? Too much of a stress signal. But what's communicating that stress signal? What's telling the brain to communicate that stress signal? Incoherence, right? So if we're in a situation where, you know, our external environment is stressful, our internal environment can't communicate with itself, with itself, uh, our mm -hmm. cells can't communicate, that's mm -hmm. communicating incoherence to the heart. And then that incoherence is related to the brain. The brain's like, ah. Uh, uh, this is stressful, and it has the stress mm -hmm. response to the body because it thinks we need mm -hmm. to get away from the threat from this from this environment that we're perceiving as stressful. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Like your body is just a big sensory organ. So we do something, anything, literally, that helps restore internal communication and create more body coherence. It's going to send a different, more coherent signal through the heart to the brain, and that changes the way your brain mm -hmm. signals to the body. Um, it's very fascinating, and it's like learning that type of thing has made, helped me make sense of so many different things as far as chiropractic, as far as heart disease, so many things. Um, that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of, uh, I guess, mentality of thinking about it. Yeah. Thanks for that. That was awesome. And I will say like, I have been like super, super proactive about water and electrolytes more than ever right now. I've been stretching a lot and i've been mm -hmm. doing my infrared red light i have the therisage like the one that awesome. you, your head comes out and yeah. then i've been wearing brain tap headset with that every morning i've been doing that for like a month straight and drinking tons and stretching and i am a living breathing example of everything you just said because i'm like yeah. mm -hmm, yep i can i know i know that's, like i that's know true how, hydration <laughs> from what you know? you're what you're saying like, like i feel what you're saying is what yeah, I'm you saying. feel it you feel the difference <laughs> yeah. and for someone that for someone like you to already have a high level of health and to feel the difference from that. It just shows how impactful it is, but that's it's true hydration. People it, yeah. like people just drink water a lot and they think, oh, I'm staying hydrated, but right. you need light. Like you need light because yeah. light is what hydrates the fascia, mm. right? So if you want to stretch and break up the scar tissue or get massage and, and various body work therapies, um, and then you hydrate with mineral rich water, and mm -hmm. then you get light, you get the infrared light mm -hmm. or the red light. The, that's what that's what structures the water onto the fascia once it's mm -hmm. broken up the scar tissue like it that's how you truly hydrate yeah thanks cool yeah i've even been getting outside like in the evening like afterwards i went for a bike ride like a little kid by myself for like i'm just mm -hmm. going all around the neighborhood <laughs> i'm like i just want to be out here it feels amazing you know yeah, well it's, it's do things it's like great. a kid would do because that's what kids do they go out yeah. and outside they run around like crazy like yeah go do it again yeah, I will. <laughs> All right, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, again, I just want to like direct everybody towards your book. It's called Understanding the Heart, Surprising Insights into the Evolutionary Origins of Heart Disease and Why It Matters by Dr. Stephen Hussey. Uh, it's Dr. Stephen Hussey on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Is there is that the main place that you serve people publicly? Uh, yeah, um, just social media is Dr. Stephen Hussey, Dr. Stephen Hussey. And then my website is resourceyourhealth.com. Resource? resourceyourhealth.com okay cool yeah. all right cool we will link that all up thank you so much it was yeah, such an course. amazing episode can't wait yeah, to share with everybody me.